All right, guys. It's weird not saying welcome back to Scarlet Sprites, but instead today it's welcome to Uplink via LI Retro. I'm very happy to be a part of this. It's very exciting. I was mentioning yesterday in light of all the different things that have gone on in the past few months with cancellations and um, you know sporting events, tickets being held and, and not validated and uh, you know, events being postponed until next season. It's really awesome to have an event to look forward to that I knew wouldn't be canceled. And then not only that, here I am, uh, 2.30 on Saturday afternoon, uh, talking to you guys about some arcades, Neo Geo. And hopefully, um, you know, this is I don't do a lot of live streaming and, uh, you know, gameplay. I don't really do Twitch or anything like that. So uh, when I do get on and, and do live sessions, it's pretty much a dialogue. I like talking to people. I don't think I'm very good at, at game playing and talking at the same time because I immediately get sucked into whoever's in the chat, uh, people I know who have commented on videos and things like that. And I just end up wanting to talk to them. So feel free to, um, you know, leave uh, comments and and keep that chat on the side rolling. I'm going to look at it from time to time today. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer everybody's questions and things like that, but I, I do kind of want this to be a dialogue. It's Saturday afternoon. We're not at work. Uh, I'm not here to give you a sales pitch or anything like that, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about arcade hunting and 30 years of the Neo Geo. Um, oh, Voltar. Look at that. See, this is why I, I, I can't get started with anything because I, I got other celebrities and guests popping in that uh, I, I'm like, I just want to talk to Voltar now. Um, but let's pull up uh, a little bit of a PowerPoint. I don't want don't start checking out on me yet here. I know I know it's only two thirty. Probably only about half of you are, are drunk at this point. So give me a little bit of time here. This is going to. Uh, take a few minutes to load in the bottom, but I'm not going to talk at you. I hope today. I, I just kind of want to go over a few things um, since we, I, I did say I would talk a little bit about arcade hunting. So um, we'll do that. And then uh, again, feel free to ask questions on the sidebar. I'm going to show some of the machines that I have in the basement and talk through some fun things that I found with some of those. And uh, this whole thing has been a learning experience for me as well. And so to say that uh, that I'm an expert on everything arcade is 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 not true, but I think that that's actually kind of why this is a cool thing to talk about because you can pick it up. You you shouldn't be intimidated by buying a machine and, and going through and and learning a few things about it. It is 2020. You've got plenty of resources at your disposal uh, in the form of guys like Voltar who are experts with repair and modification, soldering. I'm not very good at that kind of stuff, but I can I can do enough to kind of clean things up, fix traces and whatnot. Um, you've got forums to ask questions. Guys like uh, James Whalen, who run Jamination, who put out tons of information. So really that's kind of the message is that if you want something like this, you wanna pick up an arcade machine of your own, there's resources to help you get there. And so um, let's just take a, a quick look at a few of the slides here. Again, I'm not uh, selling a timeshare or anything like that. So don't check out on me. There's not a lot of words on the slides. We're going to get the pictures. So I know a lot of you are into pictures. I'm into pictures too. Um, but let's just rip through a few key points before we really get started. Um, the big thing that I often hear is people tell me, you know, arcade machines cost thousands of dollars. And, and that can be true. That absolutely can be true. If you're going through a vendor, you want to buy something completely overhauled, it's been gone through, cleaned up, all that kind of stuff, you're going to pay a premium for that. It's also the whole supply and demand thing. You're in that moment, you want to buy something. It's like, I want a, I want a Tron machine and I want it right now. You go and you start searching for that, you're, you're going to pay a lot for that machine. Whereas if you're going to be patient and just kind of wait that out and, you know, you've got a couple machines that you want to pick up that are on your bucket list, you know, when those things pop up, just be ready to grab them. And I know that's easier said than done. Having somebody that has a truck or a van is, is also 
a key thing for arcade hunting. You want to be able to call that friend up and have them ready to go. Helps if they're into arcades and video games as well, or if you can kind of pull them along into um, the madness with you, which I've tried to do more recently with my friend uh, Shelby. Uh, I think you guys may have seen that video where we went to Maryland and we were in that warehouse and he doesn't own, I mean, he doesn't even really play video games all that much, but he saw that stadium cross machine in there. He wanted it. And I was like, yep, that's why we're here. Like, let's, let's load it up. Um, and he got a really good deal on that. Um, of course, buying vendors and stuff from, uh, e buying from vendors and buying from eBay. Uh, that's a give and take. I mean, sometimes actually I'm going to show a few machines here. There's, there's deals to be had. If you can catch something that, you know, people might not necessarily be interested in and you can snipe it. Um, you, you, that can happen that, and that did happen. And I'll, I'll share that with you here in a few moments, but really the big thing for me where I've had the most success is just scouting things locally and, and kind of being, um, you know, open to looking at Craigslist, which actually seems to have, at least in my area has died out a little bit more recently. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's just a, a thing in general with Craigslist. I mean, you take away all of, um, you know, the, um, the sex stuff on there and nobody wants to go to Craigslist anymore. Um, Facebook marketplace, uh, that, uh, is, that's, that's another key thing I can talk about. I've got a machine that is a prime example of what you can pick up off of Facebook. And then of course you got offer up and let go. Um, I haven't had as much luck with those two. I know some people that I, um, talk to in forums and whatnot have, again, a lot of this is going to be regional, you know, um, just because I found something locally um, at a good price doesn't mean you are. There's definitely hotbeds of arcades that, um, you know, the Northeast, obviously, for me, it's very tough to find candy cabinets here. You start heading out west or even in Florida, for whatever reason, um, it, they seem a little bit more prominent. But here in the Northeast, very tough. And then that's going to drive prices up on you. So, you know, just kind of talking a little bit about that whole arcade machines cost thousands of dollars. This is a really nice street fighter alpha It's 300 bucks. Um, all of this stuff, you know, I screenshot it off my own phone just to share with you guys, because this has just been in the last few months or so. Um, you got a working monitor, you got a, a six button layout for each player. It looks like, you know, there might be a, a few dings here and there, but I mean, my great, my, this is just 300 bucks. I mean, that's a, that's an amazing buy for a machine like this. And you think about, what else you can do with these machines once you pick them up. So it's running Street Fighter Alpha, sure, but you can swap those boards out for other things and you can kind of use this machine to play other games. And, you know, it, it, it's really a fun thing once you start getting into it. It's also something that can become um, very uh, contagious, which um, when I first bought my first machine, which was Neo, the Neo Geo cabinet, I was like, that's it all I want. I wanted a Neo Geo machine and, and I'm done. And then you learn a little bit about that machine and how it works. Um, you know, some of the, the pinout and, you know, that uses an interesting um, uh, JAMA plus because of the extra button that it has on, on a Neo Geo. But um, yeah, you, you get sucked in pretty easily with that. So just a few more examples we go through, um, you know, talking about forums and Facebook, Facebook groups, really good resource for watching to see what people are posting. This is obviously from the Arcade Exchange the screen grab again from my phone. You got 500 bucks here for two uh, machines, one being the Shinobi. And um, some of you guys who are uh, more eagle eyed will notice that that is a track and field machine. And so, again, if you like Shinobi, maybe you're fine with this. If you want to go back to your Nintendo roots and you want to convert this back to a track and field, it, you know, it's 500 bucks and then you pull the Shinobi out of it. And if you don't want that, you can, you know, unload that to somebody else in the group and maybe they're looking for that, get some money back off of that, which is, which is great. So it kind of drives the cost down and at least until you start buying parts for the things that, you know, you may want to convert this to time killers arcade. I mean, I don't know, guys, you guys can call that out. I, it's it's not that great of a game. But again, if you look at it for what it is, um, I mean, the monitor looks tiny on that one, but uh, you can do other things with it. It doesn't have to remain a time killers arcade machine. 
Um, and maybe there's somebody out there that's looking for a Mortal Kombat ripoff. They're, they're a Mortal Kombat ripoff enthusiast and, and they want that Time Killers board and you could sell that to them. Um, I mean, this is a no brainer. This is <laughs> this is a Marvel um, superheroes versus Street Fighter. Seventy five dollars. Um, <laughs> the guy did say it worked. Uh, I don't know how great um, the picture was on the monitor, but that's another thing that you just might have to deal with for seventy five bucks. This is this is an incredible uh, machine to pick up. Again, you can do other things with it. You can pull that board out. You want to sw uh, swap the marquee you can do that as well. Uh, it's really just about looking at the potential for these machines. When you see these types of good deals that come up. Now this one steel gunner 250. Uh, this was really close to me. I messaged the guy probably about 25 minutes after he posted this and he had somebody else coming to, to pick it up. But uh, I definitely would have bought that at 250. It's a, I mean, it's a really awesome machine. I love the guns and the layout on that. Um, again, it's just being active and being aware of what's happening and, uh, you know, staying on top of your marketplace and, and what's, uh, what's going on locally to you. And then again, having that friend ready that can jump in the truck and, and go with you to pick this up. If you don't have a truck of your own, I don't. Um, but yeah, I mean, timing is really everything and being on the spot. I mean, if something comes up like this, that's 250, you've got maybe an hour to react to it, which is another thing that you just have to be aware of when you're, you're looking for arcade machines and you're trying to find good, good buys on them. And then, uh, of course I threw this in, uh, 300 bucks for a Neo Geo. Um, it's a little deceiving because that's a, that's not an original Neo Geo cabinet. Maybe you don't care. That's okay. I mean, you're, you're using it to play Neo Geo games, which is, which is fine. Uh, the control panel is a little wonky. Uh, I, I don't know if I would necessarily want that for my Neo Geo button layout. But again, that's a thing that you could change. You could swap out. Um, you know, you become uh, your own best resource for hunting down information, uh, you know, getting help. If you don't have the tools to, to kind of drill into that panel, you can buy new control panel overlays for these types of things and, um, you know, re reskin that and make it look closer to what a Neo Geo might. Um, I don't know what the side art, or I, I don't know if he had pictures of it, of what that looked like on this machine in particular, but that's another thing. You can buy side art and, and go through that and, um, you know, apply new side art if you want to. And that's usually, you know, 150, 200 bucks, which adds to the cost. But if you don't care about that, you know, nobody says you have to add new side art to these machines. So really just kind of a, a quick summary. And I promise we're going to get away from these words on these slides because nobody wants to hear words on, uh, on their weekend. Um, Facebook marketplace and groups, um, probably the primary source for me, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that, um, you know, if not every day, every other day, a couple times a week, just kind of wanting to be on top of what's out there. I don't want to miss anything that might pop up like, you know, $75 for a Marvel, um, versus street fighter. I mean, that's pretty, that's a pretty good buy. Like, I don't want that. I don't want to miss that kind of stuff. Um, space becomes a concern. You have to kind of weigh that. Um, and, you know, we already talked about the others on here. Offer up. Let's go Craigslist. Um, the arcade forums are, are good. There's um, there's the killer list of video games and they have a forum. I know in recent times that uh, people have said that that's dried up a little bit and it's not quite the way it used to be a couple of years ago, but it's still a good resource. You know, you can still go there and find information. There is still a marketplace there. I buy parts from there uh, from time to time. I actually got a, a Virtua Fighter uh, bezel for my machine because mine was all nicked up and was missing some paint and, and whatnot. But I picked up a new bezel for Virtua Fighter off there. The guy shipped it to me um, basically almost at cost because of, you know, you're shipping glass. So um, he just didn't need it, didn't want it. And I put it to good use. So definitely make sure you're, you're you know, if you're interested in arcades and you're you're wanting to uh, get into this, that you're hitting forums, doing a little bit of research, reading uh, a lot of the questions that you guys have probably can be answered by going through and, and looking at, you know, some of the pinned topics in those forums. Uh, another thing that people always ask is about shipping. Um, uh, this, uh, this woman, Michelle comes up if you, I mean, you can Google that name and, and, uh, and find her tied to pinball forums and, and arcades. Um, 
I think she's working for Beltman currently and um, phone numbers and stuff. I, I posted that too. I'm not giving away uh, anything that's not already out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's usually three, anywhere from 350 upwards of 500 bucks. But, um, uh, you know, it's an option. If you aren't finding what you want locally and you're willing to spend that extra money on something to have it shipped to you, you absolutely can can make that happen. I know uh, Fastenal on there has an interesting thing where they're basically shipping from one distribution center to another. So if you have a, one of those locations in your city or close to you, you can save a little bit on money. You just have to go to their distribution center to pick it up. It's not like dropped off at your door. So that's another option in uh, North American van lines. They come up quite frequently too, but those are three options for shipping. Uh, I've used, I've actually used Beltman um, myself, not through Michelle, but the, um, uh, the guy that I bought one of my machines from, uh, from he had contacted them and set it all up and, and shipped it to me, which is great. M most sellers won't actually do that for you. They'll want, they'll want you to just kind of handle and, and deal with it all, which um, can be a little daunting, I guess, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't have any issues calling as long as they're willing to work with your shipper and whoever it is that you're, you're um, going to use, then it's really not that big of a deal. All right. So this is my big one. This is, uh, this is virtual racing that I picked up, um, uh, a little over a year ago at this point. Uh, I took this picture specifically because people always ask if the car number one and car number two lights show show up or if they light and illuminate on the machine. They do. Um, during a track mode, they kind of blink back and forth. So uh, I had to capture this right in the in the right moment. Of course, when you play the game, uh, whoever's in the lead, that's whose uh, car number is illuminated. But this is a prime example of scouting. Um, I was watching Facebook, and this was listed as um, virtual car racing game or something. I don't know, something like that. Um, but I looked at it and this poor thing was kind of like shoved in the corner of, uh, uh it looked like it maybe was even like an outdoor barn, which I, I would believe based on the condition of this, once I started working on it, but, uh, you know, she didn't really want a whole lot of money for this. I, I want to say I ended up paying just shy of like 400 bucks for this whole thing. Um, and she was willing to put it on a trailer and drop it off at my house. And that's an interesting story too, because, um, you know, you'll meet some of these people, uh, that are selling things. And I know you guys have probably used Craigslist and, and forums and stuff before and dealing with people that you, you buy things from on the internet can always be very interesting. Uh, she was supposed to drop it off at eight o'clock that night and then, uh, didn't show up. And I texted her probably about nine and, uh, she said, Oh no, I'm still coming. I just got hung up. Right. So I was like, all right. So it's, you know, it's nine o'clock. I think it was a Friday night. No big deal. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not getting up or anything. 10 30 rolls around. I'm like, you know, are you, are you still coming? Like for real? Like, I, you know, it's not a big deal. You can just say you don't want to sell it or, you know, it, I know it's a hassle to put it on a trailer and, and bring this out to me. You know, you're, you're doing me a favor. I get it. Like just pick another day. And she's like, Oh no, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my, uh, my boyfriend's going to come and he's going to help me and everything. I'm like, okay, great. Um, midnight, midnight rolls around. There's no, uh, there's no virtual racing. There's no sign of anybody, no text, no nothing. And, uh, I'm like, Hey, I'm about to go to bed. Like, you know, it's, uh, I'm an old man, you know, at this point I'm, I'm, it's midnight. I'm going to bed here. Uh, we'll work out another time. Oh, I'm on the road. <laughs> I was like, okay, well you said eight o'clock, but, uh, I get it. All right. You're on the road. I'll, I'll wait up. All right. So I'll cut this story short a little after two in the morning. Uh, this woman shows up with virtual racing, backs it into my driveway. Um, she brought her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, and her dog that was running around my yard and in my garage and everywhere else. Sweet lady. Um, you know, it's a funny story. She was really very kind-hearted. Um, she actually texted me a little while after I, I bought this from her. And, uh, 
she asked if I got it up and running. It, it wasn't booting when I when I first got it from her, and which I knew, and, and that was okay. But it, it was just one of those weird things. My wife went to bed, locked the door, set the security system in the house. She's like, you're on your own. If you're getting murdered over virtual racing, that's your you know, that's your deal. I'm going to bed. So um, I wanted to show this too. This is the bench from virtual racing, which has this really cool piece across the back. There's actually four speakers inside of that bench. So when you're sitting down, you've, you've kind of got stereo right in your ears. It's, it's pretty cool, especially considering the time period. I mean, the plastic isn't great to sit on. I think uh, we all know that, but again, it's was built for an arcade life and is, is pretty rugged. Mm -hmm. Um, side art, we talked a little bit about that when we had the Neo Geo machine up. That's something I usually try to look at and see what kind of shape that is on, is in on a machine before I buy it. Again, you can pick up repro artwork for machines, which is, which is cool, um, if it's available. So that's another thing that you need to be conscious of is if you're wanting to do that, hit uh, up places, um, like Sabo's Arcades does really good work, um, Escape Pod Online is another one, but you can Google and and try to find the artwork and, and who you know somebody might even take a file from you and do like a custom job. I know Sabos does that sometimes, although he's a little backed up right now from what I've heard. Um, but yeah, that's something. This uh, the, the virtual racing side art was in really good shape. You can kind of see maybe a little bit by the I and the R there. There's that wrinkle with the the plastic or, or whatever that um, film is that's over top it starts to bubble. But I mean. That was the, believe me, that was the least of my worries with, with virtual racing. And you get to learn some really cool stuff um, when you're going through uh, arcade machines. I, I had no idea, and I guess I should have. Uh, everything in this machine is doubled up. I mean, I don't know why, but in my mind, I kind of had, I had assumed that because it was a twin machine, the way it was set up, it doesn't really come apart. Uh, although I know there is a virtual racing standalone that is one unit that's a, an upright machine. I kind of assumed the twin was just like its own board and its own IO and it's not, everything is, is doubled inside of this machine. Um, so that's a look. If you lift the bench back, this is what's inside, uh, that red piece of wood that it's sitting on. Um, if you guys watched the video that I did before on this, this whole thing was covered in mold. I mean, it, I, I mentioned it was sitting outside in a barn covered in mold. Um, it also smelled like urine. Uh, I was trying to find a nice way of saying that, but yeah, whatever. It's uh, it's Saturday afternoon. Uh, so there was some mouse or rat excrement as well. So again, if you want if you want an arcade deal, you're looking for something that um, you know is a, is a good buy. Sometimes you're going to pay a little bit of a price for that. Um, and I know I see Leslie over in the chat is asking, does the wood rot on arcade machines? It absolutely does. And so unfortunately for this, there was a few spots around the bottom. You'll usually see where wood starts to rot because it's taken on water damage. You know, somebody has this in a basement or somewhere, um, or even like I said, a barn and, and that, you know, the, you know, the groundwork there starts to get, take on a little bit of water. It rises or, or hell, even like snow and stuff. Like if people have this stuff stored outside, it gets wet, it sits there. It can absolutely start to rot. And then, that's where, um, you know, you start to run into questions about, do I have to tear this whole thing apart or, or what can I do? Um, I'm seeing the question, what did I do to clean that? So I'm, I'm going to jump, I think, to the next slide here, which is right on cue. So that, that whole thing, if you go out and look at the video, this thing was filthy. It was, there was all kinds of stuff on it. I really, at the, at the point of, I, I was at a crossroads where, am I going to, try to rebuild this or, you know, get, get some help. Cause I'm not a master craftsman when it comes to any type of woodworking skills, but I was actually able to get a little bit of advice on, you know, how to, how to save this. And really it came down to putting a mask on. Um, so you're not inhaling any type of mold spores, getting this thing back outside. You know, I did a wipe down, um, with some, you know, alcohol. I, I see somebody's asking, uh, I use a lot of simple green. I used uh, a mean green that had bleach in it. That's a that's a big one. Uh, and then you just sand and and you know see if you can get down to the next layer and and make this look like it should or like it used to. And there's another product called Mold Control that you can then spray on this because from what I was reading, uh, and I'm not gonna 
play a Saturday afternoon scientist here for you. But from what I was reading, you know, the bleach, the, the, the compound in the bleach doesn't actually get down into the wood fibers the way it needs to, to prevent further mold. And so there's this product called mold control you can get in. It's specifically for wood to help prevent future molding or for a reoccurrence of this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, not just mold, but, you know, we're also talking about rat and, and mouse excrement, urine, everything else. Um, there was a little, uh, a literal rat's nest inside of this. Uh, I think my wife was saying like, Hey, uh, that there's a lot of, uh, dust bunnies inside of that virtual racing machine. And, um, those weren't dust bunnies. That was an actual rat's nest and there were dead rats inside. That's probably the most successful story I had, which sounds odd. And yes, Leslie, I did say urine. Um, well, I didn't pee on it, and uh, I, I don't think um, the, the, that sweet woman that delivered it, I don't think she urinated on it either. Uh, I think it was rat urine and, and excrement. So look at this. This is the first panel I've ever done, and we're already talking about dead rats and, and urine and feces. So um, it all got cleaned up. It's sanitized. It does not smell like that anymore. Lots of sanding, mold control, um, mean green with bleach, any type of compound cleaner like that. Um, and then obviously lots of sanding to kind of make sure this, you know, you, you get down to another layer, clean it. I painted it, painted the exterior. Um, I'm, I mean, I can't believe it's three o'clock already. My wife was right. I'm going to run out of time here talking about stuff. It is a, definitely a success. So, so 400, uh, so, so $400 for a virtual racing that was in a little rough shape, but we salvaged it. It's up, it's running, it's clean. It, it works, which is awesome. Um, so two virtual cops, I got a pretty good deal on both of these. And oddly, we were talking a little bit about eBay. I got both of these machines actually on eBay. Um, they were listed pretty cheap. I basically ended up paying about, I think like a hundred bucks, maybe 150 for the, for the one. And then I paid shipping and, um, you might wonder why I wanted two virtual cops. And again, it's all about what you can do with the cabinet. So my vision for the one virtual cop is if I don't have enough things on my, on my plate already is to turn it into a house of the dead and house of the dead uses the exact same wiring that virtual cop two uses. So it'll be very easy to, well, I say very easy. I think I showed a proof of concept on, on Instagram, uh, of house of the dead up and running in, in the virtual cop two cabinet. And, uh, it works, but you know, I'm going to want to get this marquee on there. I'm going to probably at some point sand the sides, paint it black. Um, if I, if I back it up here real quick, you can probably see there's uh, yellow T molding on the side. I'd probably switch that out for red T molding is it's something that's so easy to do. It's, it just pulls right out of the machine. And then um, you got this groove that's already cut. You can buy T molding online. It's usually not too expensive. It's, you know, like I want to say like, I don't know, like 20, 25 bucks for 20 feet or something like that. So it's not a, it's not a crazy thing. Even if you just buy a machine that needs a T molding replaced on, uh, it's not a, it's not a hard thing to do. And that's the house of the dead to uh, house of the dead, not house of the dead to house of the dead board um, that pops right into the virtual cop cabinet. All the wiring that's on virtual cop hooks right up to this. Um, the placement is a little different. So you just have to be you have to be a little careful of, your, of where you're, you're plugging things into, but um, yeah, it, it works and uh, it's a cool thing. And I'm, I'm hoping maybe by the, uh, I don't know, I, I, I say by the end of the year, but there's so many other projects that I'm working on that um, I, you know, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to get this done, but there it is up and running. I took this picture. This is all, um, this is all from last night. So these are all like new photos that you guys are seeing. Uh, I took this picture because the panel, uh, the Virtual Cop 2 marquee, uh, actually at the top, uh, I, that was out when I first got this. And I just popped in a, uh, I think it's a T8 integrated LED tube. They're super cheap. They're like $12. Um, there are purists out there. Uh, I know some people think of me that way. Um, I, you know, I'll cut corners when it makes sense to. Um, replacing a ballast, a fuse, um, you got a CFL bulb in there, all that kind of stuff. It's just not worth it to me to hunt all that type of stuff down. I usually will pull it 
I'll I'll save it if I can. If it's you know if if it's in non-working condition, sometimes other people might want that for their machines. The the actual hardcore purists, but I'll just toss in uh, a T8 uh, integrated tube. Um, like I said, they're twelve bucks. I think you probably even get them cheaper than that if you if you're not buying them on on eBay or Amazon. But um, they do the job, and I have them in a lot of my machines. Uh, check the chat here. Um, Brian says uh, he's from Maryland. So yeah, there's a lot of good deals in Maryland. Um, I, the Arcade Exchange, I would definitely check that out, Brian, on Facebook. Uh, that was one of the um, the slides I had earlier. That's a good place. Um, to, and then there's the Coinop Warehouse, which is in Maryland. It's in Hagerstown. They've got a pretty good feed running, and there's a Coinop Warehouse classified group that runs as well where people just kind of list things for sale which is uh which is which is pretty good especially if you're in maryland i would definitely check that out uh real quick uh these are the two different types of guns so the one on the left is a hap gun it's used and and produced currently as a replacement the one on the right is an actual sega issued arcade gun for virtua cop 2 it, I mean, looking at them, uh, the one on the right's badass. Like, I love that gun. Um, I, I was really happy that it, it still had those. If you try to search for those guns online, they're really expensive. I mean, these the the, the gun on the right that is, two fifty, three hundred bucks just for one gun. In some cases, um, they're they're sought after. Again, they're cool. They look better than that pistol shell on the left. But um, the hap pistol will get the job done for sure i have so the one virtual cop is running the pistols the other one is running um that kind of like that judge dread type gun which is really awesome uh and then that's just a shell i, I picked up uh, so you know if you wanted to switch out the um the red shell for blue uh i want to say that the the shells are they're, they're not too expensive I mean, it's just basically plastic they're like 30 bucks i think to to pick that up if you want to change colors or if it was all banged up and you just wanted to swap it, you could do that as well. Um, uh, Mike, yeah, I'm in the Northeast. I am in Pennsylvania, South Central. Um, this is also virtual cop. Sometimes you'll get a machine um, you're locked out of and you will need to drill the lockout in order to get access to uh, what's in the coin bucket, which can also be fun finding things in the coin bucket that you weren't expecting. Uh, but of course, to get access to the actual machine, you know, the keys are usually hung up inside behind this door, which doesn't do, you know, the spare keys, they don't, doesn't do you any good because you can't get to them. Uh, Virtua Cop has a back panel that comes off that had a lock on it as well. Um, but I was able to drill the lock out on this one and then you get your keys out and then away you go. And that brings us to um, replacement locks. You can, I mean, that's pretty simple thing um it's basically just like a i think it's a hex nut that you just twist and you can put the i don't even really use the locking mechanisms on there i put them back on the machines for show because sometimes i want to store parts in the coin bucket i don't want to have to lock things and keep you know I, i'm not like at risk for having um you know things getting stolen out of my basement normally but you can buy replacement locks then just to kind of replace the feel and the look of the machine after you drill it out Uh, this was a really cool thing uh, I thought I'd show too regarding Virtua Cop. Uh, the tube for this panel is actually mounted facing upwards in the bottom of this, the machine. So this is actually, this is, this is, I know I had two machines, but this is just one of them. So what you're seeing on the bottom here is the tube facing upwards from inside the machine. And behind it, there's this mirrored panel that you're actually looking at when you're playing the game. You're watching uh, or playing off of a reflection, essentially. And what that does is give an added sense of depth to the overall experience. So when you're standing there looking at the machine, it looks like the, the monitor might be maybe a little bit bigger, but it's also like you're, you're staring down a, a tunnel in some ways. And I'm sure that that actually factors into the light gun play and, and how that behaves. But it's a really cool effect. It was something I wasn't necessarily aware of when, when I picked up the machine. I didn't realize that. I just kind of thought the tube was mounted facing the player like any other machine, but it, it's not. Uh, and there's a shot of the tube facing upwards, um, which is, you know, the bottom of the, um, 
arcade is obviously at the southern point of the picture. It's the wood down there. And then, um, but normally if you're looking at this, you'd think you're looking top down, but you're, you're not, you're looking straight into the cabinet, which is cool. Um, that an anode cap there, don't touch that when the, <laughs> that's another big lesson. Don't touch that when the uh, arcade is turned on, you want to use precautions around that. Um, it's probably one of the more dangerous things. Uh, Daytona USA, this is another good deal that I picked up. Um, I was just talking to um, uh, somebody in the chat here about the uh, CoinOp Warehouse in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, I mentioned earlier, a friend and I went there. He got his stadium cross there. Uh, Daytona USA, I picked up is $400 for, for a, a twin Daytona. Now, granted, the monitor was out on the one side, which I, I sent that out for, for repair, um, but... Again, I mean, it's four hundred dollars for a Daytona USA racing machine, which is um, which is crazy. Uh, it's just it's just a crazy deal. And it, it, as long as you're willing to put in a little bit of work, uh, do a little bit of research, you know, I had to pull the monitor chassis out of this. Um, some of you guys, I see retro RGB in the side, Voltar. Those guys are probably able to do this kind of stuff themselves. I don't feel comfortable working on a monitor chassis. I don't know the internals as well as those guys might, or, or a true techie. So there's plenty of resources, people out there that will do this type of work for you. Uh, obviously you're going to pay for it, but, uh, but yeah, um, 400 bucks, uh, you know, I'm going to spend a little bit more to get the chassis and the monitor back up on, on the one unit. But in the end, it should still, it should still be a hell of a deal for, for something like this. That's the, um, the right, um, the second car, I should say. Oh yeah. The Daytona song, everybody, everybody, when I picked this up on social media, everybody was like DMing me and, and writing the, you know, Daytona out with all the extra N's and A's, which is funny. So this is, uh, <laughs> that, that ding that you're looking at there. Um, that's an unfortunate event that happened that I caused, which, I mean, I don't think you guys know how much that crushes me from somebody who tries to preserve this stuff, who takes extra precautions and it's my machine now. Um, but I caused this, um, because the units shifted in the trailer when we were driving, we had them strapped down, always put a blanket between the machines when, um, even if you think that they're strapped down and you've got them secured put something between them. This was my fault. I did this. Um, I'm looking at right now, um, I bought this fluorescent orange vinyl. And what I'm going to do is probably probably um, do a, a fine cut along the, the black where the actual artwork ends from. You can kind of see that checkered pattern. I'm going to take a ruler and do an exacto across that. Peel off this um, nasty piece where I, I dinged it up. Uh, do a little bit of sanding and then just apply this across the bottom and, and probably clean that up. And again, it's just being creative, trying to find things that you might be able to do to fix up your machine. Uh, I don't know um, if that's, uh, you know, what everybody would do, but, you know, I just started looking around and, and we'll see if that works and, and hopefully that it does. Um, there's a shifter. You can kind of see that's broken. Um, there's some, uh, some of the micro switches on that. The, I mean, obviously when I booted the thing up and chose manual for steering, uh, and this didn't work. Uh, I knew it needed to be pulled and replaced. Um, you can buy replacements of those. If you do buy, if you do buy the shifter for this, it's like 150 bucks direct through HAP. So again, you're going to want to hit forums and wait and see if somebody pops in on, uh, those forums that, that sells, uh, a shifters. Maybe it's already used, but it's in working order because you don't necessarily want to be spending $300 on, on new shifters or, the return on your investment of it being a good deal starts to diminish when you, you know, you start doing things like that. But you know what, if, if you want to just buy it outright and be done with it, that's fine too. Um, there's one of those integrated LEDs that I was talking about. That one's actually four feet long because that's the marquee for Daytona. Again, the light, the ballast, all that stuff. It just, it wasn't working, pulled it all out. That's a, uh, that's a four foot tube. Uh, again, I think it was like 12, 15 bucks for something like that. And it's done and it lights up. It looks good. Um, but that's just another one of those things. And that's just a shot down of the Daytona 
of the Daytona um, vehicle. There's a lot of boards inside this. I wouldn't recommend picking up a racing machine if it's your first arcade machine because there's a lot going on inside that beyond just the power supply and the board and the monitor. There's a lot of little intricacies. The thing closest to us, like maybe at the, well, I should say the southern point of the picture is the I.O. board. Um, you move north and you've got the uh, control, or, I'm sorry, the uh, the actual uh, board for Daytona. That's the ROM board on top. I think it's a three stack. And then you get into where your feet normally sit and you've got sound amps in there. You've got the power supply. You've got things for um, steering, the shifter. It's just crazy stuff to, to kind of get into. I, I would recommend starting off small if it's your first machine uh, and not biting off too much uh, or else you might get overwhelmed on, on something like that. Um, speaking of getting overwhelmed, I typically just take and, and toss all these screws as you're taking things apart and mark them in bags. It's just a, a very common, simple thing that I do. Uh, otherwise, you end up with screws all over the place and, and you're wondering um, what the hell goes where. And I do see the time. We're, we're already uh, 10 after 3, and we haven't talked about Neo Geo at all. So I'll kind of flip through these rest of these slides without trying to be too overwinded. This is a Capcom Big Blue that I picked up. Uh, this was actually a marketplace find. Uh, the eagle eyes here might notice there's a seam down the right-hand side where you can kind of see some light coming through because that bezel that's on the Capcom Big Blue is not the original bezel. There's a shroud, a cardboard shroud that normally goes around the, uh, the actual monitor. And then there's a piece of wood that goes on top of that. It's actually kind of a haphazard look for the Big Blue. I was, I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that that's what Capcom rolled with. Um, and I, and th this just doesn't quite fit the way I'd like it to over the monitor, but I'll, I'll end up cleaning that up at some point. All right, Retro RGB is out. He's getting ready for his panel. Make sure you guys check him out when he's ready to go. Uh, I see Dylan's asking candy cab questions here on the side. Oh, speaking of the LED lights that I'm all I'm all in on and I'm always talking about, top is um, the Capcom Big Blue with the standard CFL bulb in it. And then the bottom is after I replaced it with one of those cheap $12 LEDs. I, I will say people sometimes prefer the, the, the look of the top. It, it has a warmer feel to it. It's very reminiscent. I call it dingy. That's probably not a positive word to use for it, but it does have like this warmer, like dingier look to it. Um, you know, something that you might have seen in your grandma's house, like when you were growing up as a kid, how her lights were always like that. My grandma's house was like that. Um, but it has a more of like that yellowed look to it. And some people prefer that because it reminds them more of, it's a more authentic look of, of how an arcade was. I kind of like personally for me, um, how the colors pop, how bright adding that LED light is to a machine. I think it makes it look a little bit better. I mean, if you're looking at Magneto here in the top left, like he's, he's pretty much lost on the CFL bowl, but you know, everybody is kind of illuminated there on, on the LED. I'm going to try to flip through. I did pull the X-Men versus Street Fighter board out of that, and I popped in the Darksoft CPS2. Um, so with that, I can pretty much run any uh, CPS2 game off of the original hardware that's in there. So and, you know, I say original hardware, but obviously the Darksoft kit is not original, but it is getting the game ROMs to the original board for you to run and get that authentic experience off of. This is an LCD selector for the game that's under the control panel. Um, so you can fire that up and, um, you know, play whatever game you want. The game will stay in the memory on the board. So next time I turn it on, if I have um, Alien vs. Predator or whatever on there, it'll stay there until I change it, which is which is really nice. And my Virtua Fighter, you know, speaking of arcade hunting and arcade um, finds, Virtua Fighter is a game that doesn't seem to get a lot of love. I personally, it reminds me back in the day, it was one of the true games that pulled me away from Street Fighter 2. I was a big Street Fighter 2 guy in the arcade and I, I didn't really have, even Mortal Kombat, I was like, okay, you know, Mortal Kombat, whatever, great. Um, but Virtua Fighter really, I mean, it was just something that was so prominent and that whole 3D, the polygons, and I, I was mesmerized by it. I, I mean, it was really just announcing 
on the arcade floor. This is where arcade gaming is going. More than that, it was where it was where gaming in general was going. It was moving from the 2D sprites we were used to into the 3D realm. And this game just kind of announced that. And I, I was always blown away by that. The game doesn't get a lot of love today. Um, I know some of the later Virtua Fighters, there's more of, a, of an audience for, but um, Virtua Fighter 2 is obviously, I think still, people still talk about that a lot. But I, I love the original because of what it, it meant to me at the time. I put a lot of quarters into this. And thankfully for me, it's a game that doesn't get a lot of love out in um, the community. And so the guy had this listed on Craigslist. And he had it listed, I, I want to say it was like $400. And I was just sitting at my desk at work. Hopefully nobody at, at work is watching right now. I don't, I don't, I don't scan for arcade games at work. I, I do my job. Um, it was my lunch hour. I'm pretty sure it was my lunch hour. I looked on Craigslist and saw this for 400 bucks. And I just kind of on a whim, I was like, yeah, you know what? If you want to drop it off tonight for 250, I'll take it. And he called my bluff and I ended up picking up a fully functioning Virtua Fighter, 250 bucks dropped off in my garage. So um, again, it's just all about scouting and, and, and being aware of what's going on, you know, out locally to you. And, and you know, sometimes, you know, I, I don't typically try to lowball people. Um, I don't really know that that was a, that much of a lowball. I've seen these sell for 300 bucks, but um, it was here in my city. I knew he was local. I wasn't like I was telling him. I'll give you 250 and drive from West Virginia. It was, he was, you know, here locally to me in, in Harrisburg and yeah, he dropped it off for me. So good find for me. Uh, it's a midway sports station. Uh, it's a four player. Uh, picked that up locally too. It runs Showtime and Blitz, which is, which is great. Um, a few things on this, uh, the sports station cabinet. This is a, this is an actual dedicated sports station. So you see the Blitz artwork on the top and showtime on the bottom a lot of these will just have a sticker slapped on the side of them because they've been convert their blitz machines or or showtime machines have been converted over to run both games but this is actually a dedicated machine that had both in it use uh uses 49 optical uh 49 way optical joysticks too which is also interesting hat did reproduce these but i don't think that they're all that great from what I've read. I've never used one, so I shouldn't really comment on that, I, I suppose. But everything I've read on the HAP ones that have been reproduced, not not great feedback. Thankfully, these are all originals that I have in here. Um, and then upgrading things, you can see there's the hard drive that ran this game on the right. It's currently unplugged, but I left it, I left it inside the machine. And to the left there with the blue sticker on it is compact flash card that runs Showtime and Blitz plugs right into the board seamlessly. It's it's pretty cool. Um, somebody I thought I just saw somebody talk about candy cabs recently in the chat here. This is um, my Astro City, which I would say um, is another good another good tip for arcade hunting. Just something that is straight JAMA wired that you can plug a number of different boards into and run. Will give you the most bang for your buck initially. So even like that, um, thinking back to the Street Fighter Alpha cabinet that I showed earlier, JAMA wired. You can play a lot of different things in that. It has a six button layout, so you're not going to be crippled on, uh, you know, playing fighting games if if they have six buttons or whatever. Um, you know, most JAMA games, the older ones are, are just three buttons. But um, there's a lot of versatility with a, a straight JAMA wired cabinet and. Um, that's what the Astro City is for me. I have the, obviously I have the STV hooked up here, and uh, I plug Sunset Riders into this. I had Mortal Kombat, Ultimate Mortal Kombat three plugged into this, and I, it's just so easy to swap things in and out and, and get that arcade experience, which is great. Um, you don't have to have a machine just play one game. You can you can swap the boards out if you got something that's JAMA wired. Uh, Marissa is asking, do you ever have to worry about static electricity when touching the inner boards of an arcade? You absolutely do. And especially when, you know, you're thinking about a board that is very near and dear to your heart, something you don't want to replace, something that's not cheap. And very few arcade boards are cheap these days. Uh, I'm thinking about something like I don't have this game, but like Turtles in Time, that thing is selling for like, I've seen it as low as five recently but I've, it, i think the 
current one on eBay is like 750 and, and people are getting that. You don't want to touch those boards if you're, you know, you're, you're carrying a charge because accidents can happen. You can have some mishaps. Um, normally for me, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing something like that, you can get a working on, on machines, you can get like a wrist strap or something like that to, to kind of help protect you from having to, um, feel like you're going to ruin, uh, something really expensive. You can do it the cheap way too. There's a lot of metal parts on, um, the Astro city. And I'd be lying if I told you I didn't sometimes, um, before I go work on a board lean and, and I, I, you know, I, I touch myself to, something to, to ground myself, like one of the ground wires or something on the Astro City. I don't recommend that. Just get the wrist strap. Um, don't listen to me as far as that stuff goes. There's the Blast City. That's my other candy cab. These are not deals. Uh, these were not uh, deals that I got uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Again, I'm in the Northeast, hunting these things down, asking quite They had to be shipped to me, which automatically added uh, overhead. But they were two machines that I wanted, the Astro City, the Blast City. Um, the Blast City plays host to my Naomi 2 setup. And I think I have a, yeah. So there's a really nice net boot setup for that, which is, you know, basically allows you to send all the Naomi games and a Thomas Wave games actually to um, the Naomi hardware. So you can load and play a lot of things. Again, it's getting bang for your buck out of your arcade machine. It's not, I think a lot of people say like, oh, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of effort or money to put towards having just one game in my house. And, and I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be one game. You can, there's multi kits available. Hell there's Pandora boxes. I, I, I'm not a big advocate of that. I mean, if you're, if you're going with an arcade machine and you want to have that authentic experience, I, I'm not a proponent of putting an emulation box inside of it after you have it. But you might be, and you might not care. You might just want this as a display piece and want to play some games. That's fine. Like you should definitely do that then. But there are ways to play games, multiple games on original hardware using multi kits, and um, this is this is one of them. You can you can net boot. I do hope that Darksoft or somebody like that comes up with uh, a cartridge that plugs in because the net boot setup can be a little wonky. You basically have this Pi device that's sending. You know, you can cycle through on the LCD here and pick which game you want to then send over Ethernet into the Naomi board, and it'll load it. Um, it's a little, it's, it's a very power hungry setup. And sometimes the Naomi doesn't necessarily, um, you know, always boot well for me. I I've had more problems it seems than, than most, but, uh, it's a very power hungry setup. Oh yeah. There's somebody's talking about their net dim setup. Yep. Dolphin blue. You stream dolphin blue. Dolphin blue is a great game. I, I argue that dolphin blue is the best metal slug since metal slug three. And there it is, the Neo Geo uh, coming down the home stretch here. We've got about uh, got a little little bit of time, ten minutes or so. Um, I don't think we're going to get that full thirty years of Neo Geo history in um, after I, I talked about arcades for so long. Um, but uh, this this is the Neo Geo, and I would say for me, this is the gateway to arcades and Neo Geo SNK. I should say even bridge that gap really well you know in 1990 when the aes came out it was offering their arcade boards to a home consumer and there was no there was no difference between the games that you were playing in the arcade versus the games you were buying at home it was expensive i didn't know anybody that had a neo geo when i was a kid but damn did i want it i i really wanted it and it's been 30 years um but you know, I got the machine in my house. I know a lot of people collect the AES. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot. I know, I know a few because I follow the forums and I, and I, in different Facebook groups and whatnot, but the AES games are expensive. They're real expensive to hop in on that. Now it, it's a lot. you I mean, you need deep pockets to go pretty far into that library. Um, you know, you're talking thousands of dollars per game um, for a cartridge, and, and that's a lot. The MVS carts that run in the arcade machine are a lot cheaper even still. I know they've gone up in the last five years because I've, I've watched um, just scouting here and there, looking at different sales, but they've gone up in price too, but they're still for the most part, not anywhere near what we would see for 
for say um, the AES versions of, of things. Like you look up Metal Slug for MVS versus AES and, and just do that comparison. It's crazy. Um, this, uh, I, you know, I'm trying to close out with the, with the Neo Geo here. This is also a learning experience for me because this is the first arcade machine that, that I purchased. Thankfully, cosmetically, it's in really good shape. Uh, it's, it's in, um, it's honestly, it's in phenomenal shape. Uh, and for that, I, I'm really lucky. It was, however, sold to me as fully working and it wasn't fully working when I got it. Um, that's just a shot of the interior. I've got, I'm switching carts out again. These are all live photos from, from last night. So, um, but it's a four slot, uh, board that's inside there. Uh, the machine was missing sound on the left side. There was a trace broken on the board. And that's where I first learned about trace repairs and how to do them. And again, uh, calling out James Whalen of Jamination, uh, you know, he answered, I, I was having problems with that and I posted on a forum and he responded and, and talked me through what a, what a trace repair is. That's really rare. That's hard to find somebody that is that genuine and helpful to new people. And it's something that I'm trying to do more of myself picking up again i'm not anywhere near the expert that that some of these guys are but if i if i see something and i can help somebody i try to because i know people were there for me when i first started and that was really um something that um you know you can feel lost when you, you get your first arcade machine if you don't have help and you've got questions um just a little bit of a look of the inside the wiring i replaced the buttons on on this one um, and here's the other thing that didn't work, uh, was this panel, the mark, the mini marquees, they all have these individual led panels that light up individually based on the game that's selected. Um, you'll find that out on most games, uh, most arcade machines, I should say it doesn't work. I actually had two problems on this. The actual control board that controls those panels had some burned up components on it. So I was, I actually, I feel pretty proud about this. I, I replaced that myself. I was able to get in, um, desolder and put on a, a few new, uh, re, I think they were a couple of resistors that were burned up on it. And, and I was able to fix that myself. Um, the panels themselves, you can buy this a six side from glow hut. Um, there's probably some other places you can get them and then they just solder right to the, the panel. You can take the old ones off, put the new ones on and, and they cycle and they, they light up. So I got my machine up and running. Um, yeah, Dylan's calling out James from JNX. JNX, um, uh, James is, is phenomenal. He's, he's such a good guy. He's, um, I, I can't say enough good things about him because he didn't know me. He didn't know who I was. I didn't have a YouTube channel or anything like that. He was just helping a complete stranger get his Neo Geo arcade machine up and running. And um, I really will never forget that. It's a, uh, it, it, it's just a, such a genuine um, selfless act to, to, to do and, and to help somebody out on the internet. Um, so this is a shot, basically, um, you can kind of see like, it's the same stuff that's going on behind me here. Um, I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit where we're, we got two minutes now for Neo Geo, but, uh, you know, I've been collecting that for some time now. It's been probably, I want to say 2007, 2008 ish when I first bought my first MVS cart, which was metal slug, just because at the time I, I knew I wanted to collect for Neo Geo. I knew I wanted to play those games. I had hoped that someday I would have an arcade machine and I just started adding those games before I even really had a way of playing them. I didn't even have a consoleized board at that, at that time, but throughout the years, I was able to go through and, um, you know, work on, on picking up different cartridges, finding deals, buying things in lots, getting rid of cartridges I already had. Uh, we're obviously looking at Samurai Showdown uh, 5 Special, which is probably, um, you know, one of the, the more expensive games that you could find on the system. It's also the last official uh, Neo Geo issued MVS card. I know um, Special Perfect is, is out via that, that collection now, but, uh, you know, physically issued in the era. This was the last game that, that SNK put out for it. Um, just a shot of, of some complete kits that I, that I've picked up over time, you know, I'll be honest, you know, 2008, 2007, I was just picking up 
carts because they were relatively cheap. I wasn't interested in the full kits. I kind of kick myself now because I probably could have got a lot of these kits a, a lot cheaper back then. But, um, you know, being somewhat fresh out of college at the time, um, living in a one bedroom apartment, I was doing what I could, you know, I'm, I'm picking up MVS carts and just uh, thinking that that was great. And that's kind of how I built my collection up, up through, um, through time. People always ask, what's the hardest, what is the hardest game I, I had to find? It was definitely Irritating Maze, which um, you can see that label is, that still bothers me. That label on the right is, is nicked up a little bit, but I'm not going to get picky. I just needed uh, to add this to the collection. It was difficult to find. I actually had somebody that visits my YouTube channel, um, uh, Pops, who called this out for me. And it was in a, it was actually in a uh, group sale and I was able to get it, which was uh, really, really awesome. I don't have a trackball to play this. So I use the controller hack via the Unibios and uh, get by on that when I want to experience Irritating Maze. Some of you guys probably know the Irritating Stick is a follow-up. It's available for PlayStation. If you're interested in what ir Irritating Maze is like, if you play Irritating Stick, it's, it's basically the same thing. I do think this is definitely a game that if you had an arcade setup, with a trackball, it's probably a hell of a lot more fun. It's not great with a controller. Um, from a completionist standpoint, uh, you know, this is th this had to be added and I wanted it. I did have this idea. Uh, I know we're a little over on time. I don't think they're cutting me off. Um, I do think, you know, I had this idea of picking up an arcade one up centipede with that had the trackball in it. And then getting some artwork done for irritating maze and creating a dedicated irritating maze setup um, using the centipede trackball um, cabinet that arcade one up has. I don't know. Um, how much do I really like the irritating maze? And is that, is that worth it? Maybe from uh, an SNK collecting standpoint, it might be something fun to have more than enough projects uh, in my queue right now. That's not something that, I've, um, I've prioritized by any stretch, but that idea is there. You're welcome to it. If anybody, if anybody else wants to steal that idea and do it, I'd love to, to follow that and, and see that done. Um, I know Sabo's arcade. I mentioned them before. We'll do custom artwork. Could definitely, it's, it's definitely a reality. So, oh, there's Corey Carlson from, uh, my life in gaming. Thanks for stopping by Corey. Yeah, Neo Drift Out does not, you're right, Neo Drift Out does not pop up for MVS very often. Um, I've noticed that in the last five years, there's there's certain games that once seemed prominent that are just becoming more and more difficult to find. Um, people always ask, what are you playing right now? Um, this is this was taken uh, last night before I went to bed. Polestar is loaded up in, in my Neo Geo here in the game room. I don't know. I just have, uh, I, I feel like I, I really have close ties to that game after, you know, I, I don't remember. I think that was two summers ago. I basically memorized it in order to beat it, which um, is a strategy that um, <laughs> you probably need to do. Cause if you try to just quarter feed this, it's a, it can be a, a rough go, especially in the latter sta uh, latter stages. So um, I love the music for Polestar too. It's one of my favorites. I play it often. Um, more recently, obviously, you know, again, I know we're running short on time. We're talking about 30 years of Neo Geo. Where are we today? Um, you know, we've got the mini, obviously, that's out, which um, some of you um, probably saw some of the videos I did on this before. I, I think the Neo Geo mini, it's got a good game selection. I think the screen is actually pretty good and has a little standalone unit. It's, it's really cool. Uh, I, I think it could have instantly have been better. And, it, and it's just software related. Uh, button mapping would have helped this. And I also think being able to turn off video filtering um, to get rid of that blurry look on the output would have helped. So those two things, if those were corrected, this thing's instantly better in, in my mind. Obviously you've got the Neo Geo Arcade Stick Pro. Uh, I don't get a lot of perks as a YouTuber. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hobby and something that I just find fun to do as an extension of, of gaming. Um, but Neo, uh, SNK did send me this, which, uh, was, was actually really exciting and it, it was very validating. It's like, oh, wow. They, they know that, uh, I do a lot of, uh, SNK and Neo Geo stuff. They, they know I'm a fan. So that was really cool to actually, uh, be sent this and, and be able to talk about it. And thankfully 
this does have button mapping and does uh, have options for your video filtering. Although I don't know who wants vertical scan lines, but they're there if you want them, you know, you can do that. Uh, I obviously, I replaced the buttons on this uh, with some Seimitsu parts and, and uh, made it a little bit uh, more authentic for my eyes with the uh, red, yellow, green, blue layout across the top like that. And uh, I would just like to say at this point, uh, some of you who watch the channel who know uh, Real Bout Fatal Fury was the last MVS cart that I needed to complete my collection. I'm uh, kind of announcing that for the first time here at Uplink via LI Retro. My MVS collection is complete. And I want to give a special thanks to Will at RetroHacks.net. Um, Will's been a, a really great friend uh, the last couple of years, um, based out of Columbus, I believe. He runs a great web, uh, website, does mod work, and uh, has fixed uh, a few PCBs for me. He installed my high-def NES kit, uh, but he actually said he had this game laying there, and he's like, I'm not playing it. If that's really the last one that you need for your collection, you know, I'll, I'll send it to you. And he did. Um, so that, and that's a really cool way to close out um, your MVS collection. And um, that, so that journey is complete thanks to a friend. There's some other people too I should probably thank throughout this who not only scouted and found carts they knew I needed, um, I got a, a good trade. I know uh, I mentioned Pops earlier and he had sent me a cart that I needed as well for the collection. Um, he still has not collected on that. I think he's waiting to see if I, if I pull in something really decent that he needs, but, um, there's been so many great people down the stretch that have helped me finish this off. Um, and so the last, the last piece will retrohacks.net definitely, if you see him on Twitter, follow him, um, tell him, thanks. Uh, he did a, he, he did me a, a solid on this. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to pause there. I did a lot of talking. I was worried about filling an hour and I actually ended up running out of time. Uh, Corey knows Will. See, Will's a good guy. And you know, if my life in gaming knows Will, you know, you know, he must be a good, good person. Um, and there, yeah, he's doing mod work for my life in gaming. Um, and he says he's good friends with Jason from Game Tech. Yeah. Um, Will fixed my open ice uh, PCB board, which also, um, speaking of stat static electricity, not cheap. If you go out and try to buy a, an open ice arcade board from Midway, it's the end. It's the uh, hockey version of Midway's NBA Jam series, which I loved. Uh, I was stoked when I saw that first appear in the arcades, but it had some problems and um, some of the chips. I, I know there were some broken traces, and Will went through that whole board. He socketed all the chips so I could easily go in and, and burn new EPROMs and replace things out on it and get it up and running. Um, because I'm certainly not buying another one of those boards. They're, they're ridiculously expensive. They're, they're 500 bucks easy right now. They're not, um, it's not a, it's not a common game, but because it's midway and kind of falls in that, um, NBA jam type territory, it's expensive. So yeah, we'll fix that. Like I said, high def NES kit install he did. And he also fixed a, uh, a top loader for me. Um, that was probably like two or three years ago before I even really knew him. So I'm going to pause there. I will say before I forget, um, if there's not any questions or anything on the side here, um, I, I don't know. Uh, I think, I don't think it's a spoiler. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm going to be on, uh, later on this evening too, with Mr. Ali, the author of MBA jam, the book I'll be on with him co-hosting, um, that is completely his show. Uh, maybe he won't want me, won't want me on after I just um, ran my own panel um, ten minutes over. But uh, I'm going to be on later tonight. Uh, speaking of midway games and a lot of fun things coming, you should definitely check that book out uh, if you get a chance. And uh, we'll be on talking that at six. I think it's six fifteen uh, or six thirty this evening. I'll be back on with uh, uh, Mr. Ali and NBA Jam the book. So I'll pause there. I'll, Stop talking. I've talked a lot here. So I know there's a there's a bit of a delay, so I'm going to give it a few more seconds. And 
if no other questions or anything in the chat, um, I really want to thank you guys for stopping out uh, and, and listening to me talk about arcades and, and a little bit of Neo Geo. I hope that you uh, check out the channel. I'm planning on doing more. I'm going to obviously do a wrap up video on completing the MVS collection and um, talk about that a little bit and maybe do a little montage of each of the games in the collection. There'll be more Neo Geo to come on the channel, uh, more arcade stuff. I know it's a little bit more uh, niche than, than some of the stuff other people do and talk about, but it's what I love. And, um, you know, it's, it's fun for me and uh, keeps, keeps me busy from, um, you know, a, a creation standpoint. All right. I think that's it for me. Thanks again, everybody, uh, for participating, showing up to see me, uh, and also for buying a ticket and coming out to Uplink, the event that was not canceled on you uh, this summer. Definitely um, uh, thanks for, uh, for coming out. Thanks for the questions. And I hope that I get to see all of you guys again uh, this evening. Thanks, everyone.